Hi folks, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to be talking about what I'm dubbing the crime of the century. On the 1st of July 2019, Nan Goldin, an American photographer, led a small group of protesters who unfurled a banner, Take Down the Sacklinane, against the backdrop of the Louvre's glass pyramid. Within two weeks, the museum had removed the plaque at the gallery entrance about the Sackler's donations made to the museum, and throughout the museum, grey tape covered signs such as Sackler Wing signage for the Oriental and Arabic collections, which had been so-called since 1997. The Louvre in Paris was the first major museum to erase its public association with the Sackler family name. Around the same time, three and a half thousand miles away, a lawsuit was brought in the Southern District of New York. This wasn't just any lawsuit, it included more than 500 counties, cities and Native American tribes. It named eight family members, Richard, Jonathan, Mortimer, Kathy, David, Berkeley and Teresa Sackler, as well as Leanne Sackler left court. In addition, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island and Utah all brought suits against the family. At a federal level, the family faced an overall bundle of 1,600 cases. So what is going on? Well, to answer this, and to connect the dots between the two events, we need to go back in time. In fact, almost 90 years. In the 1930s, three brothers were growing up in Brooklyn, New York, Arthur, Mortimer and Raymond Sackler. All three went to medical school and worked together, initially in psychiatry. They've actually been cited as early pioneers in medication techniques which ended the common practice of lobotomies and were also regarded as the first to fight for the racial integration of blood banks. In 1952, the brothers brought a small pharmaceutical company, Purdue Frederick. Raymond and Mortimer ran Purdue, while Arthur, the oldest brother, became a pioneer in medical advertising. He devised campaigns appealing directly to doctors and enlisted prominent physicians to endorse Purdue's products. He was also one of the foremost art collectors of his generation and donated the majority of his collections to museums around the world. After his death in 1987, his option on one third of Purdue Frederick was sold by his estate to his two brothers, who turned it into the Purdue Farmer as we know it today. So far, so good. In 1972, Contin, which is a controlled drug release system, was developed and in 1984, its extended release formulation of morphine, MS Contin, was also released. This was a very effective drug, but the profitability waned after generic substitutes started to lower the market price rapidly. Purdue needed something new, and this came in 1995 when the FDA, that's the Food and Drug Administration's approval, was given for its extended release formulation of oxycodone, brand named Oxycontin, and this was officially launched in 1996. Now just to explain a bit further, Oxycontin is an opioid, and opioids are a class of drugs naturally found in the opium poppy plant, and they work on the brain to produce a variety of effects, including the relief of pain. When taken orally, it has roughly one and a half times the effect of morphine. Now the approval of Oxycontin is considered the 0 0.0 trigger for the current wave of opioid addiction and abuse that has swept America and other parts of the world and continues right up to the current day. To say that Purdue's sales efforts were aggressive is an understatement. Here in one memo from the 25th of Jan 1999 to the sales team, which I'll read, Reps are told their bonuses will be calculated in a way that makes the incentive for selling OxyContin much, much greater than for selling MS Contin. Your priority is to sell, sell, sell OxyContin, the memo said, pointing out the specific playing conditions to emphasize and sell for. It's concluded, finally continue to highlight the advantages of OxyContin specifically for use in the elderly. Look at this sales conference meeting from the 1990s. The 
the guy on the suit on stage. Yep, you guessed it, he's the VP of sales for Purdue. Another example to demonstrate the aggressive sales approach was from Richard Sackler. He's the son of Raymond Sackler and he told company officials in 2008 to measure our performance by RXs by strength, giving higher measures to higher strengths. And this was verified with documents tied to a claim that Purdue Pharma and members of the Sackler family knew that higher doses of OxyContin over long periods would increase the risk of serious side effects, including addiction. The idea behind the drug's release process was that it was designed supposedly to deliver pain relief over a 12 hour period, so patients would only have to take two tablets a day. However, by all anecdotal evidence and court filings, patients and doctors were finding that it didn't. It lasted say four, five, six, seven hours and then the effects would wear off. Therefore, the doctors would prescribe stronger doses and the patients would often then take their next tablet sooner than advised. As the stronger tablets were much, much more profitable for Purdue and patients were using them faster, sales, revenues and profits soared at the company. But this was at the cost of a great societal impact. So having given the background to the development of OxyContin, let's return to Nan Golding as a case study in what goes wrong when patients get addicted to their painkillers. Now Golding is a very well-known American photographer who's chronicled her life through photography and particularly exposure and involvement in the LGBT community in the Western US and later with the punk movement in New York and beyond. One of her most notable works is The Ballad of Sexual Dependency which was published in 1986 and we can see a couple of images from that here. Now I can't really add any more to her addiction story than she can herself. So here are some extracts from her own activist posting where she explains the addiction and how and why she decided to target the Sackler family. I'm Nan Golden. I started OxyContin in 2014. I had a wrist surgery. I had a nerve trapped in my wrist. I was in Berlin. Before the operation, I was in a great deal of pain. The doctor prescribed me 40 milligrams and it was too strong for me which is really ironic because at the end I was on 450 milligrams. Within a two days, I would say I was addicted. The surgery came, it was two months later, and already by that time, before the anesthesia, I took eight oxys. So that shows like within a month how high the addiction, fast the addiction went. First, I had a doctor that was prescribing, two different doctors. They found out about each other. I came back to New York and I had a dealer that delivered 24-7. He texted me in rehab that he was having a sale. They cost a dollar a milligram. Normally it was 30 milligrams and they were $30. So it was an incredibly expensive habit. It's the way that it grows, the way it's prescribed. It's one in the morning and one at night. It doesn't work 12 hours, which is one of the big, big scandals. The experience is it deadens you, but it embraces you. You're in a warm bubble and nothing can hurt you. And all your anxiety is gone. That's the beginning. That's what's so seductive about opiates. I was snorting 450 milligrams a day. It was a full-time job. That's all I did. The rate of relapse is 91%. That's how hard it is to stay clean. And it's much harder without the kind of relapse prevention programs and the kind of support that people need to get. The Sackler family I'd heard of from Wings and the Met, from education spaces in the Guggenheim, Wing at the Natural History Museum, a big courtyard and big museums in England. And also being from Boston, I knew the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Cambridge. Also, we need to get to the Sacklers themselves, like the people at their cocktail parties. That's what we need, to find people that the Sacklers would actually care about, standing up to them and telling them, this can't go on. The first action was to publish the portfolio of the Sackler signage and my drug use in art form. This is the petition of pain. My group is called PAIN, which stands for Prescription Addiction Intervention Now. I've been clean, sober for 10 months. 
And as a lawyer said to me yesterday, who's in recovery, the first year is like having no skin on your body. Wow, that's quite something, isn't it? Nam went on not just to target the Sackler family name at the Louvre, but at institutions across America too, most of which have since dropped or curtailed their Sackler connections. In New York City this weekend, protesters flooded the Guggenheim Museum. They dropped fake prescription slips from the upper walkway, angry that the museum takes big donations from the Sackler family, which has been accused of engineering the opioid epidemic. Nan's story isn't just in isolation though, vast numbers of people have been affected. Let's take a look at a couple of charts that show just how much the epidemic spread over the last few decades. And these charts are looking at unintentional overdoses. Well, we can see here in the late 70s, early 80s, just a few cases. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, which was just before OxyContin was given its FDA license, a few more. Now, after the license was given and the drug started to be sold mainstream, we can see a notable increase. Just roll forward a few more years and look at this final map from the mid 2010s. That is just shocking, isn't it? In 2018, Purdue Pharma patented a new form of buprenorphine, which controls cravings and is used to treat addictions to opioids such as OxyContin. Now, just take a second or two to digest that. Here is a company that is aggressively selling one product, OxyContin, that is leading to high levels of abuse and addiction going on to sell another product designed to treat that exact addiction that their first product causes in the first place. Honestly, I don't have enough words to describe just how twisted that is. Let's come back to the court cases. As we saw earlier, there has been a large number of cases relating to the mis-selling of OxyContin by Purdue and its officers. Let's have a look at a couple of them and then we'll roll forward to where we are right now. In 2004, West Virginia sued Purdue for reimbursement of, in quotes, excessive prescription costs and, in quotes, deceptive marketing. Patients were taking more of the drug than they had been prescribed because the effects of the drug wore off hours before the 12-hour schedule. Now, the judge wrote, The plaintiff's evidence shows Purdue could have tested the safety and efficacy of OxyContin at eight hours, and could have amended their label, but did not. Now this case was settled before trial, but it is telling because it shines a light on the heart of the mis-selling approach Purdue followed. In May 2007, the company pleaded guilty of misleading the public about OxyContin's risk of addiction and agreed to pay over 600 million in what was then one of the largest pharmaceutical settlements in US history. Here's the breaking news. Good evening. The maker of a hugely popular painkiller has some pain of its own tonight. The company and its top officers will pay $634 million in fines for lying to the public. The company's president at the time, Michael Friedman, top lawyer Howard R. Adel, and former chief medical officer Paul D. Goldenheim pleaded guilty as individuals to misbranding charges, a criminal violation, and agreed to pay a total of $34.5 million between them in fines. In addition, they were charged with a felony and sentenced to 400 hours of community service in drug treatment programs. Well, you might be surprised that until now we've not heard too much of the Sackler family in these court cases. And part of the reason for this was that they and Purdue settled time and time again with the condition that the court documents remained sealed. However, all this was about to change when in May 2018, six states Florida, Nevada, North Carolina, North Dakota, Tennessee and Texas filed lawsuits charging deceptive marketing practices, adding to 16 previously filed lawsuits by other US states and Puerto Rico. By January 2019, 36 states were suing Purdue Pharma. Massachusetts Attorney General states in the lawsuit that eight members of the Sackler family are, in quotes, personally responsible for the deception. They micromanaged a deceptive sales campaign. The reason that the Sackler family and their name couldn't be avoided in these cases is in part due to the continuing publicity that the likes of Nan Goldin were creating, as such as this demonstration.
There are several other settlements with individual states amounting to hundreds of millions in fines in the intervening period, primarily for mis-selling, but I'll go right to the 2019 cases and then we can roll forward right up to date. In 2019, Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family negotiated to settle the claims. Here is the breaking news which is about just a part of the overall settlement which not only included the monetary fine but a Chapter 11 filing by Purdue Pharma which would be restructured as a public beneficiary trust and the Sackler family would give up ownership of the company. It's being hailed by the federal government as a major victory against a company whose drug, OxyContin, is part of the public health crisis of opioid addiction that has led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans. The maker of OxyContin admitted to defrauding regulators and paying illegal kickbacks to doctors. Addiction treatment drugs currently developed by the company would be given to the public cost-free. All profits of Purdue would henceforth go to the plaintiffs in the case. And on top of that, the Sackler family would contribute $3 billion in cash. The family would also sell Mundi Pharma, which I haven't mentioned yet, but is another family-owned drug company, and contribute another $1.5 billion from the sales proceeds to the settlement. However, the Sackler family would remain, and still remains, a billionaire family, and would not be criminally charged for contributing to the opioid crisis. In September 2019, the office of the New York Attorney General accused the Sackler family of hiding money by wiring at least $1 billion from company accounts to personal accounts overseas. So, while negotiating the claims and during an audit to help with the process transfer to the public trust, Alex Partners, who are the auditors, found that the Sackler family withdrew $10.7 billion from Purdue after the family began to receive legal scrutiny. Well, okay, the Sacklers might or might not have done this properly, but that's not what the justice system thinks. The DAJ think that they may have taken the money to avoid giving it to creditors. Well, perhaps it's just one big coincidence or an accident that $10.7 went their way. Make up your mind on that one. You would think at this point, with overwhelming evidence of the harm that their product had done and was continuing to do in America, that the Sackler family would start to take some responsibility for their actions in creating the epidemic. Well, you'd be wrong. Here's Richard Sackler responding to questions in deposition, a video that the Sackler family fought very hard not to get into the public arena. How much money has Purdue Frederick or Purdue Pharma made off the sale of OxyContin? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't know, but I, I just don't know. He's not really demonstrating charisma, is he? Well, do you know? Do I know? Well, he certainly doesn't know, does he? Let's take a look at Kathy Sackler appearing in court. Now, she was another hands-on officer of the company, and when she wasn't in such hot water, she was very keen to portray her key role in the OxyContin development, in one email even claiming that the whole idea originated with her. Let's take a look at her accepting responsibility in court. I have tried to figure out, was is there anything that I could have done differently knowing what I knew then, not what I know now? And, and I... I have to say, it is, I can't, there is nothing that I can find that I would have done differently. Unbelievable, isn't it? Not a single grain of contrition shown. Well, you might think that it's just in these rare glimpses of the family we see in court that this avoidance of responsibility is shown. Nope, that's not the case. Do you know they've actually set up a website, judgeforyourselves.info, that aims to show every piece of evidence that could put them in a good light. In simple terms, their website would be better off called nothingtodowithus.com. You might be wondering why the family didn't buy the website judgeforyourselves.com and instead went for the .info domain. Well, John Oliver and the HBO team, who have commented on the whole OxyContin and Sackler saga in an attempt to give the big F you to them, did. And if you go to that website, as well as being able to see all of those depositions and emails that the Sackler family wanted to hide, you get this introduction. Hi, it's me, the real Richard Sackler. Welcome to the premier source of information on the Sackler family that you can find on the internet. It's called judgeforyourselves.com. But you gotta get the dot com. <laughs> I mean, what? what kind of fucking idiot 
would set up an important website and not buy the dot com. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, if you want the truth, you've come to the right place. So click around, okay? Get a sense of what my terrible family has done. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll throw in some makeup tidbits. I don't know, maybe uh, uh, how to make a great pesto chicken. Anyway, there's some great buttons that you press around, and uh, you'll get there somehow. Anyway, best of luck to you, all right? Bye-bye. Just brilliant. In a final wrapping up, in October 2020, Purdue agreed to an $8 billion settlement. That includes a $2 billion criminal forfeiture, a $3.54 billion criminal fine, and $2.8 billion in damages for its civil liability. It will plead guilty to three criminal charges and it will become a public benefit company under a trust that is required to consider American public health. The Sacklers will not be permitted to be involved in the new company. With over 400 cases that named one or more of the Sackler family, how did they react? Well, they said in 2021 that they would only agree to the court settlement if they could get, as part of the terms, a non-consensual third-party release. What the hell is that? Well, if agreed, simply put, it would protect them and their assets from lawsuits linked to the opioid crisis, apparently from the beginning of time, which seems quite a long time to me, but that's what it says. All existing cases against them would evaporate in the blink of an eye, and no more could be made. In reaction to this, US representatives introduced a so-called Sackler Act so as to prevent people who have not filed for bankruptcy from being released from lawsuits brought by states, municipalities or the US government. Now, I don't think that this will be retrospective, but at least it will prevent people hiding behind essentially artificial barriers to blame and avoiding the consequences of their actions. Are there any conclusions we can draw from all of this? A couple of takeaways that I can think of and are maybe worth mentioning are Firstly, OxyContin was not the only opioid brand that contributed to the whole opioid epidemic. Companies like Insys, who sold their own product, should also be held accountable. The regulatory authorities should also take some responsibility. One example of where they've failed is when small regional pharmacies were distributing huge amounts of opioids for prescriptions that would never be just for their local populations. Instead, these prescriptions found their way onto grey or black markets, and these early warning signs could have been stepped on immediately and with vigour. The early withdrawal of the £10 billion from Purdue by the Sackler family before the court cases were settled is troubling. I personally hope that this has had or will have a rigorous investigation, and if any foul play is discovered, then the perpetrators are held to account with the fullest extent of the law. Okay, I hope you found this video enjoyable and at least informative. Please subscribe to the channel to help me out and if you hit the notification bell, you won't miss out on any future videos. Bye for now.